My name is Robin Abramson. I'm also a Pragmatic Works consultant. I'm a senior consultant at Pragmatic Works. I work with Paul Turley as well, and he's also lounging somewhere in California while we're here doing this. Um, <laughs> I put this together very quickly because, and actually I thought about doing that for a topic instead, but there was just no time to make it. We have been working nonstop since last Friday on a uh, very important project for our client with a uh, coronavirus supply chain issue. Um, so I think that might be a really interesting topic for a future <laughs> presentation now, but... Um, wait, no, no, the client's on the East Coast, um, which means I have to be online at 4 a.m. tomorrow, but... <laughs> so we found that the more people use Power BI that are coming in as like C-suite users, or you know, not your real power users, not your real business analysts, but the real people up at the top, they expect Power BI to act like an application. They expect it to do all the things that you can do with an application and just be able to see what they want. So the real challenge becomes how can we give them data in a way that makes them able to run their business and makes them feel empowered to do it without relying on the analysts to do everything for them. I'm going to skip over a couple of these because we've got a real short time. <laughs> um, but basically it's this, you know, you, you used to have to have an analyst do everything for you. There wasn't a lot of self-service. And now what we're trying to do is empowering even, you know, the top PC users to basically figure out what they're doing on their own. So the techniques um, I'm going to, I use to do this are what-if parameters. I'm sure you're all have used those. Has everyone used those here? Yeah. Splicer tables, another familiar technique. Measures with switch, another very familiar technique, kind of old school. And unpivoted data to make dynamic columns. Um, this particular report is using AdventureWorks data, added 5 million rows so that we would have some fun stuff to work with. And you'd be able to see that, it, yes, it still does work fast and uh, went a little bit overboard. So what if parameters, I'm not going to go too much into these just because we have a very short period of time. But um, remember to use meaningful names. Um, we're going to use top end so that they can choose how many records they want to see. Again, I'm not going to teach you guys how to make a top end measure in this, in this particular. Um, slicer tables. Just a matter of making a table that has the list of items that you want them to be able to slice by. Uh, add it to your dynamic table so you can choose what you're slicing by. And add the categories that you want as a slicer. Um, here's a measure with switch example. Again, I'm not going to teach you how to write this today. OK, when you unpivot a table to use it as a dynamic column, this is where the fun stuff happens. You want to have a unique index of some kind on that dynamic table. Hopefully, there's already one there if it's a fact table from somewhere that you can use. But if you don't have one, just use the Power BI index function if you have to. It's going to make things a little slower to use that because it's a unique value all the way through the table. But um, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to right click and make a reference copy of your table. And then you're going to rename it to something meaningful. Then you're going to select the index and the columns that you want to turn into categories. For instance, say I want people to be able to um, slice and dice by my year and month, but also I want them to be able to slice and dice by the business categories and um, maybe the market regions. I can put all three of those in here and use those to let people look at their data in three different ways because that's how they want to see it. Now I'm going to highlight the columns except for the index, click on unpivot columns, and unpivot only the selected columns. And I'll show you this later. I um, have an example of the M code that it creates. And here's what you end up with, the same thing that you just saw in the previous presentation. Um, you have an unpivoted table, you have an index, an attribute, and a value in this case. 
And the index is going to be how you are actually connecting to your fact table. It's a one-to-one -one relationship, basically. Or one-to-many, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, when you add your relationships, you're going to need to do, you're doing all kinds of things that Marco and the crowd say, don't do. But you have to do them to make this work. <laughs> Um, use a both-way um, relationship between your dynamic table and your fact table. And then you have one way on your slicer table. Um, I'm going to, here's how you name your uh, dynamic table. I don't need to show you guys that. And here's an example of a file. So let me go, I think that's the fastest I've ever been through that. <laughs> So here's the file. Um, as you can see, we have these dynamic slicers here. I can switch everything and look at everything by the unit price. Or no, I want to look at it by sales amount. And it actually filters all the visuals that you have selected that are related to it so that you can look at things however they want to look at them. And that way you don't have to make three pages where you can just have one visual and a different title. Um, on the side here, I also have, this is another set, and as you can see, it's changing not just what, how many records I'm getting back in the values, but it's also changing what the column is it's using. And just to give you an idea, I have a dynamic column in here. And basically, it's looking at the slicer, taking the first non-blank value, and just using the related value to pull in a different value than what is just sitting there, which is nothing, basically. So that your axis literally becomes whatever you've chosen in your slicer. So any questions so far? Wow, I'm going a lot fast. I, I'm guys trying to go super fast, and I'm going really fast. <laughs> Any questions? And while we're waiting, I want to call up Rachel because she was my first Power BI teacher. <laughs> I'm going to provide the, the slide deck and the PBIX file. And just to give you an idea of how this has turned out to be super useful in the particular project I'm working on right now with the um, coronavirus supply chain issues, I'm using the same technique to let them um, look at a map. But the dynamic column is what's driving the map. So they're able to look at the map by business group, by supply chain, by customer region. It becomes super valuable when you have a million different ways you want to look at the same data and be able to actually provide a visual story of what you're looking at. Any other questions? Uh -huh. uh, can, you do the, can you do the same or something similar um, instead of using Switch? Could you use like JSON or DAX or? Well, uh, Switch is a DAX function. So, so yes, in DAX, you could bring in the data already kind of modeled this way, but it's a little bit harder to do. It's, um, this is kind of a holy grail thing for me. I was trying for years to figure out how to do this. Um, because the difference here is that since you're using the same visualization for multiple axes, you can not have to use, like in, in the old school way, you would probably use bookmarks and have different um, visuals on top of each other. Um, or you do switch, but the, the thing about switch is when you have maybe eight or nine different um, values in your switch and you have a, you know, seven or eight million rows in your Power BI, it gets to you spending a lot of time optimizing because it can start really slowing down. Um, so if you have a good model and you have not too many other weirdnesses other than that one two-way connection, it actually works really quickly. I mean, you can see there's like no lag here at all when I'm using this big Eventworks data model. 
Also, I didn't show you here at the top end. I can also choose how many records I show. And uh, I'll show you that measure since this is also all included. Um, in the PowerPoint presentation, you'll see the actual measure I use. I have it in there. And also, you'll have the PBIX that has it with it um, in a lot of titles so that it would change. <laughs> and here's the, there's the switch. And here's my rank X. It's just a really simple rank X. I'm choosing the selected value of how many records you want to bring in from your what if parameter, which is that top end. And just simply saying if it's more than that, don't show it. So any other questions? I, I seem to have pounded through this. <laughs> yeah, um, this is really great, by the way. I really oh, thank appreciate you. it. Definitely try to implement some of the techniques. Um, I was wondering, to me it seems like it may be a little more of an advanced kind of thing for someone to look at, you know, multiple measures and different um, categories. So. I kind of went a little berserk with this one, yeah. <laughs> one of the challenges I have is people, you know, don't know where the reset button is and stuff, and they can mm -hmm. get confused. So do you have any thoughts on, if you have to do any extra training of the people using this, or if you maybe have some uh, kind of thoughts around when you would want to use a technique? technique like this or where you mentioned, you know, you maybe have multiple pages or multiple right. measures of anything. Like what have you found to make this sort of in this case the most successful? I gotta tell you, every time I've implemented this, they've said give me more. Great. And I've dealt with a lot of business owners who are not technical at all. Using it in a map visual where you want to see sales by different metrics is awesome. Um, and generally, I would use like one of the vertical ones, like I have down the side, and let them choose what they want. And then it just fills the map visual with those numbers by that slicing. Um, and I don't have to make 60 million map pages anymore. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Can you just group all those or do you group this together and uh, group the bottom? It's not really grouped. I just put a uh, rectangle there. <laughs> um, but I think I did actually go in and, and only have them interact with certain ones. If I remember right, it's been quite a while since I made this. Let's see. No, I didn't. They all interact. I think I, I have a version two of this that got a, that's a little bit longer and a little bit more complicated, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and the reason, what I did with that one, I, it was way too long to even think about bringing here, but <laughs> I think what I did with that one is I used an example of a retail store. Now they're going to have periods throughout the year that they know are going to be their huge sale periods. For instance, I used a liquor store and I got a real liquor store's um, uh, revenue from, I think it was the state of Iowa publishes that stuff. And then what I did was I made some nonlinear date combinations, like the 10 days before Thanksgiving, the 10 days before Christmas, um, Valentine's Day. And none of them match, they're all weird, but I'm letting them slice by those 10 day combinations or even put them next to each other. Um, a common use case I do with this is I'll have this screen split in two sides. And then I'll let, have both slicers on top and let them compare apples to oranges with their group of um, metrics. It works really well when you're trying to compare date periods that don't normally make sense. I mean, you can't use a relative date slicer to get you know, this versus that with just a button click. Um, so anyways. Anybody else going once, going twice? Oh, well, Robin, <laughs> thank you so thank you. much. Thank you.